Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native, and the father of the effortless English system that trains you to speak English fluently, speak English powerfully, speak English confidently, think in English, speak English effortlessly. You commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Commit today. Commit, important word, commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Everyone is fighting a great battle. I can't remember who's th- that quote, but that's it's kind of a famous quote. I can't remember who said it though. <laughs> I'll just search online. You can tell me, tell me on gab, gab.com to let me know who said it. But the quote is this. Here's the quote. Everybody you meet is fighting a great battle. Everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. What does that mean? What does that mean? Everybody you meet is fighting a great battle. Well, this idea, what the idea is of this quote is that all of us, each one of us, has problems, challenges, difficulties, dreams, goals, pain, suffering, problems. Everyone. This is part of life. This is part of life. Cannot escape it. Maybe for some time during your life, everything might be really easy. No problems. Everything's fantastic. But eventually, (laughs) eventually, you also are going to have great battles, right? Great fights, meaning great challenges, problems, difficulties. All of us, every human, this is part of being human. You could even say it's part of being alive because even animals have to struggle. Everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. An emotional battle, a mental battle, a spiritual battle. All of us. Now this quote... This idea is not meant to be sad or negative, but it's the opposite. What it means is that you're not alone. You're not alone. Okay, when, when, you, when you are feeling your life is very tough, when you're having challenges, when you feel lonely, when you have difficulties, all of these things, you're not alone. Everybody has to deal with these sometime, eventually. Everybody. We all have our battles to fight in life. So you're not alone. I know sometimes it feels like you're alone. Especially when life is very tough. But you're not alone. And not only everybody you meet now, but also from the past. All your ancestors, all those generations of humans for thousands and thousands and thousands of years face so many problems. And you can read what they wrote. All right, this is such a great gift. 
so special we have that we can read what many of these great ancestors, people from the past, what they wrote. And we see they had the same questions about life. They struggled with the same basic problems of suffering, of pain, of difficulty, of loss, all these things. You're not alone. You're part of life. You're part of all humanity now and then going back thousands and thousands and thousands, maybe even millions, hundreds of thousands at least, years. So you're not alone in any of this. This is why reading those old books, why it's so important, because you're not alone. You don't have to figure these things out all by yourself. Read what the great people from the past, what did they think about all these problems and difficulties? What answers did they have? The philosophers, the sages, a sage is someone who's very wise, the saints, the prophets, the scientists, the thinkers, the warriors, the kings and emperors, the poets. Look to them to guide you when you feel lost. This loneliness I mentioned in the last show I feel is one of the deepest and biggest problems of our age. Our age meaning our time period. Age has different, we can use it in different ways. This word age, of course, the most common meaning of age is, you know, how old are you? I'm 36, right? That's your age. But also we use age, the word age, it means a time in history, a period in history, right? We can use, say the modern age, the modern age, the industrial age. It means the industrial period. And of course, you know, there are many different ways to think about this. But, you know, when I think of the modern age, I think of it starting sometime. Well, it depends. You, you could say maybe the 1700s or the really modern age would be the Industrial Revolution, maybe sometime in the later 1800s or 1900s when we started getting machines and things like that. Especially as the 1900s, so the last hundred years or so, something like that, a little over the hundred last hundred years, where we really see this this issue, this problem of loneliness, loneliness, such a deep loneliness, a feeling of disconnection, like our connections are very important feelings of connection are getting weaker and weaker and breaking apart. Recently on Gab, Gab is social media, G-A-B dot com. Follow me there, Gab dot com. My name on Gab is A-J Hogue, A-J-H-O-G-E. Follow me on Gab. But on Gab, uh, somebody posted something about loneliness and how, you know, this idea of loneliness. And it was kind of an interesting post, an interesting article and this article or essay or post talked about the different kinds of loneliness. So the writer, I think it was a man, the writer, he, uh, he, he said, you know, loneliness, there are actually different kinds of loneliness, he thinks. He thinks that we are suffering now from several, many different kinds of loneliness, that we have different needs, right, for connection. And we need all of them to feel healthy, to feel happy, to not feel lonely. 
The opposite of feeling lonely would be to feel connected. To feel that you belong, a feeling of belonging. This did not used to be such a problem. When you read uh, ancient stories and ancient books, this you don't see the same amount of loneliness, 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 this feeling of disconnection, not usually. It was a kind of an, uh, it would be a very unusual thing that would be very, very painful for the hero of a story in the past. But now when uh, when we read stories, it's such a common thing. And I think, you know, not just reading stories, just when I meet people, this feeling of loneliness is is killing us. So let's talk about the different kinds of loneliness in the article. And then I've, you know, I kind of, I've added to his list. He identified three, the writer, but I think there are four. The first kind of loneliness, a lot of people will only think of this one, is the loneliness for uh, a man or a woman or a girl or a boy. Right, it's that that loneliness of let's say if it's a boy, a teenage boy, where he feels that desire for a girlfriend, or if it's a man and he's single, a feeling of loneliness because he doesn't have a girlfriend. So that's one kind of loneliness, you know, wanting a a woman or a man. But I think it, uh, I think it's bigger than just that. I th- I'd say it's really the loneliness of wanting a family. That's how I would say it. The loneliness for, the, the need for family. I mentioned before, you know, I looked at my family history. It's so interesting to me as I read it and study it. And, and one of the main things I see every single generation going back 900 years big families, lots of children, every generation, lots of children, until, well, in fact, until my grandfather. So that's the World War II generation. And then suddenly, small family, only two kids. And then my dad, again, only two kids. I never thought about this when I was growing up, but when I think about it now, I look at it and I realize that is a big change and it does create a lot of loneliness, a great loneliness, big families, big families. Eliminated that loneliness. Right? If, you're, if you're born immediately into a big family, you have several brothers and sisters. And then, of course, if, if everyone in the family has a lot of children, that means you also have a lot of uncles and aunts. It means you also have a lot of cousins. So you're part of, immediately, as a small child, you're immediately part of this big group, always and forever. They're always your family, forever your family. It's hard to feel lonely in that situation. I mean, really, you know, you're 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 never alone if you don't, unless you want to be. It's interesting because when I look at my mom's family, my mom's side of the family, it's the opposite. Now they had my mom has uh, three brothers and sisters, siblings. We call it siblings. Sibling means brother or sister. So my mom's family was still big. And it's very interesting because the family's much closer. There's much more of a connection between them. Right? They're 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 close together. And you know what? They all have they all live in the same area. You know, within I'd say what, about an hour driving, they can all visit each other. So then there are several cousins and uncles and aunts that are all in that area. So they have that big family connection. Even now, my mother's age, you know, she's still very close to her. 
have one brother she's very close to, and then there's another brother she's close to, and then she's still close to her aunt. I mean, to her sister, my aunt, also. So there's none of that loneliness. She doesn't have that loneliness of family. And, of course, then my sister also. My sister lives in the same town with my mom, and my sister has a big family, five children. So my mom, my parents divorced, so my mom, she, she's, she didn't get remarried, but she's not lonely. Even though she doesn't have a husband now, she's not lonely because she has so much family. But so many people don't have that now. So there's loneliness for family. That includes, when you're single, that includes, you know, wanting to, you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. But um, it really means family, the whole big thing. Because when you have all of that family, you're just not going to feel lonely. Not for that. The second kind of loneliness I would call loneliness for a people. Loneliness for a people. This means, you know, for your own people. It, it really means, you know, your own community. So going beyond just, first there's family, right? And then there's a whole collection of families. Now community, that might mean a city or a town or a neighborhood. Or community might mean a whole nation. But people who share the same values, the same language, usually the same traditions, the same general history, all of these things. This also gives you a feeling of belonging, a feeling of connection. You're part of a people. So even if, if for some reason, maybe uh, you were born into a very small family, maybe you don't have many family connections, but if you have that strong community, well, then it's easy to make lots of friends, to have lots of connections, right? You know lots and lots and lots of people in your community. So again, you're not going to feel so lonely. If everywhere you go, you know everybody, right? I discussed this about my mom again when she grew up in a small town. Everybody knew everyone else. Even if you're not your family, right? You knew all the neighbors knew each other. They knew, they, if they go went to the store, to the grocery, they knew the employees, their names, every, everybody knew everybody else. They would stop in the street and talk to each other. So this very, very, very close community. So again, very natural, that was, and is, what is natural for human beings. It is being destroyed by the, the globalists unfortunately, making us all feel lonely. I think in most places that has been destroyed now. And if you don't have a big family, then there's a very good chance you're going to feel lonely. The last kind of loneliness, uh, the writer described as a loneliness for God. I would call it a loneliness for purpose, higher purpose, but again, something bigger than yourself, meaning, purpose, God, faith, bigger than you, this also connects you to everything, so again, you don't feel so lonely because you feel like, oh, I'm not separate. I'm not separate from everybody. I'm not separate from everything. I am part of all of it, everything, under God, under Tao, under Dharma, whatever words you want to use. And this is how so, so many of the saints could go off. They would go off into the desert or up into the mountains or the forest alone and meditate and pray and they wouldn't feel alone. They wouldn't feel lonely because they, they were connected to this you know, great spiritual, this great spirit 
this great spiritual power, whatever you want to call it. These were for thousands and thousands and thousands of years in all civilizations that survived and were healthy. These were the three ways of belonging. You know, your family, your people, meaning your community, and your faith. Another way to say it would be, you know, God, family, nation. This is the one I've seen, uh, one version of it. God and family and nation. The three pillars of society, meaning the three supports, the three things that can hold and save and preserve and create a successful society, a successful civilization. If you break one of these, civilization will gradually get weaker and weaker and fall apart. If you break two, it will fall apart quickly. If you break all three, it will be destroyed very, very quickly in just a few generations. And that's what's happening around the world right now. The whole globalist system is designed to break all three of these, to destroy the family with divorce by making people not want children, to destroy the family, by destroying the community so everybody's moving around, nobody knows their neighbors, nobody trusts anyone else, uh, using immigration to bring in a lot of uh, strange people from different countries and people don't speak the same language, people don't have the same traditions, they don't have the same values, they don't trust each other. So destroy the community, destroy the, the people, the nation. And then number three, destroy faith, destroy religion with atheism, pornography, destruction of virtue and honor all of these and when you destroy all of these three when you break these three pillars these three supports of civilization then it falls apart very fast and then you see what we have you see this disease of loneliness and isolation everywhere in the world very quickly and it becomes deeper and deeper and worse and worse you see this disease of young people who feel no purpose no enthusiasm it's very strange you know young people are supposed to be traditionally right they're the ones with all the enthusiasm who have so many big dreams right who are full of purpose That's what it used to be like. I feel strange now. I'm 50. I'm 50 years old. And yet most, for example, most Americans I meet who are young, like 20 years old, I feel like I have more energy than most of them. I feel like I'm more enthusiastic than them. I feel like I have uh, more of a feeling of purpose than they do. It's very strange. I feel like they're old like they're old people who are half dead. It's because they feel this loneliness. It's because they don't feel meaning. They have no purpose. They have no meaning. They feel isolated and alone and depressed and afraid because these three pillars are broken for them. They don't have a community or nation anymore. Their families are all broken up by divorce and arguments and disagreements. And they're small. Their churches in America, traditionally Christian, so their churches are weak, full of weird, strange teachings. The traditions are broken. They don't trust their churches either. All three broken. And so America's falling apart very quickly. Very, very quickly. It's going to end very, very badly. But it's happening... You know, it's happening quickly in America. It's happening even faster in Canada. 
but it's happening in most countries around the world at different speeds. It's a tragedy. All of human civilization under threat. So this is why we have all around the world so many people depressed, lonely, feeling no purpose in life. What does my life mean? This is why I get this question so many times on social media. AJ, how do I find my purpose? AJ, I don't even have a purpose. I don't I feel nothing. I can't figure it out. I don't know. AJ, help. What do I do? I I you know, I don't feel I don't feel connected to my parents or my brothers and sisters. It's it's sad. Well, it's it's not an accident. It's because of you know the tools of you know I've, I talked about yesterday who who is doing this, the people of the lie, the people behind this. But their tools, the main tools of this, are fake schools and fake media. You know the media is for the adults mostly, although for kids also programming them to break these three. And then the schools also to teach a lot of fake things and to again break these. The schools are a very strong method of breaking families. Very strong. Take away the children. Take the kids away from their parents. Take them away from their moms. Take them away from their dads. Keep them for many, many hours a day. And then teach them a lot of nonsense and lies that go against their tradition, that go against their people, that go against what their parents believe. When you do that for 12 years or more, then naturally you get what's called a generation gap. You get this situation where the children can't understand the parents, where the parents can't connect with, can't talk to the children. Right? Because their values, their thinking is, comp is quite different. Well, it's because of the schools. It's because the parents did not educate their children. The parents were not the educators. Somebody else was. Who? Government workers. Paid by the government. Controlled by the bankers. That's why I hate the schools so much, why they are so dangerous, because they are family killers. They are designed to weaken your family. Okay? It's, it's not normal that kids, meaning young adults, you know, 18, 20, 25 years old, it is not normal that they have so many problems connecting with their parents. Of course, it's not everybody. Maybe you have a great connection with your parents. I hope so. But, you know, go look around. It's not... The usual situation is that teenagers and then and older, kids in their 20s, youth in their 20s, that they, even if they, you know, they love their parents and it, there's no, there are no big problems, there's just a communication gap. They don't understand each other. And this makes the family quite weak. And then the media, the fake media, is the second method or tool that's used to destroy everything. Because the media, TV, news, movies, newspapers, all of that, continues the lies from school for adults. So your whole life, you're getting these lies, right? So you're going to see, again, they're always attacking your community, your nation, your tradition. Always, 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 they'll be attacking these things. Telling you it's bad to be loyal to your own people. Telling you it's bad to follow tradition. Telling you everything old and ancient is bad and evil and racist and all these terrible things. Right? They're breaking the community in this way breaking your traditions, breaking the community, continuing weakening the family. 
They send messages for young men and young women. What? Go out, drink, party, right? Date a lot of boys. Date a lot of girls. They make marriage look like it's terrible and boring and kids having kids is oh it's such a stressful thing and so terrible no don't do that just go out and be single sex in the city drink and have fun woohoo again this right it's helping to destroy families destroy tradition destroy communities and of course the other thing you're going to notice is that in the media that anyone who is religious who believes in God who is uh uh, self-disciplined they make them look like they're either stupid or crazy right so religious people are crazy like crazy terrorists or religious people are crazy racist or they're really stupid you're going to see this in the media constantly all the time they're not going to show in the news or in TV or in movies they're not going to show or discuss the very 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 intelligent Religious philosophers and philosophies and ideas, the great morality, the great traditions, you're not going to see any of that because their goal is to, again, to break and destroy these religions, these philosophies even. And again, replace it with what? Materialism. Buy, buy, buy. Party, party, party. Pleasure and things. Pleasure and things is what they're selling you. Buy lots of things and have lots of, you know, pleasure, physical pleasures. So if you do feel depressed, if you do feel lonely and alone, if you feel like you don't have that purpose or meaning, you're not alone. You're not alone because... Millions and millions, I'd say billions of people around the world now are feeling the same thing. Billions of people everywhere in the world are feeling the same thing. It's a global attack. It's a global situation. Everyone is fighting this battle now. We're all fighting this battle. All we need to do is wake up. All we need to do is wake up and understand the problem, understand the attack. And then you can fight back. And then you can join all those millions and billions in fighting back. We can rebuild. We can reclaim our families, our communities and nations, our religions, our philosophies, our virtues. We can. Individually we can. And also as groups, as a family, as a group, as a community, as a nation. As the world. We can and we will fight back. And I do see this. I see it online a lot. It's only online right now. But I think people around the world are waking up to this. They're starting to wake up. People are starting to realize it's not just me. It's not just me that feels lonely. It's not just me that that is seeing this this destruction of the family and the community and faith. People are waking up everywhere. And how do you fight back? How do you heal this so that you don't feel so depressed? So that you find a purpose? Well, what a great purpose. What a great purpose to fight back. What a great purpose to rebuild family, community, and faith. What a great battle. That'll give your life some meaning to fight for those three. To make them stronger in your own life and in your country and in the whole world. You know, starting with family, of course, individually. You can work to improve the connections with 
the relationships with and in your family. It's not always easy. I know that. You know, some of us luckily have wonderful families and they're already very good. Great. Some of us don't. But you do the best you can. That's one of our codes, right? Do the best you can. Now, you might do this. Hopefully, you can do this with your with the family, the older generations in your family, your parents, your uncles, your aunts. If they're alive, still your grandparents. And then your cousins. Just start making the effort with them. It's a good place to start. Just start sending them some emails. Just uh, call them up on the phone. I, it might be a surprise to them, but just call them up. Chat with them for a few minutes. It, if you're not used to talking to them for a long time, just start very short. Hey, just, hi, how are you doing? I just, you know, I never call you. And I uh, just, just wanted to call and say hi, see how, how's your life? Just ask him a question. How's your life? What are you doing? How, how's life? Let him talk for a few minutes and then say, okay, well, great. Hey, good talking to you. Great to talk to you. Talk to you again soon. Start there. If they live close enough, you know, invite them to your house for dinner. Go to lunch with them. If you have enough family nearby... You know, have some family uh, gatherings. Invite everybody at the same time, right? You, everybody can bring some food. You could do it once a month. You could do it once a year if everybody is far away. Don't wait for someone else in your family to organize this. You can do it. You can do it. And in this way, you will start to build the connections. So using our... The benefits of our modern technology, phone calls and emails and Skype calls in between, and then whenever you can, face-to-face. -face. I'm doing this in my own family. You know, I'm calling my parents much more now. I still make an effort with cousins to stay in contact with them. And I've done, done what I can to help them. They're younger than I am, much younger than I am. So I've tried to help them a little bit with their jobs or careers or school and I have nephews and nieces that I'm very very close to and I, I make an effort to, they're young they're, they're just little small children I make an effort to play with them to, to go out and play with them and see them as much as I can and my wife does this also so that's one way to fight back. Another way to fight back, have children. If you're young enough to have kids, have kids. You know, I used to be against having kids because I was brainwashed just like everybody else. And I guess I wasn't ready, but have kids. Have as many as you can. They're wonderful. They're great. If, if you make an effort to have some discipline, you know, to love them and have discipline. If you learn a little bit about being a good parent and, and having some discipline and having some rules, then you, it will be a wonderful, wonderful experience. And you can have lots of kids. It can be a lot of fun. You'll, you're not, you'll never feel lonely again. And then in general, you know, support other families. Support uh, movements, uh, politics, economics, anything that makes families stronger, any laws, any, any rules, any traditions that make families stronger and bigger and better, support those in your community, in your country. Fight back to help rebuild families. The second thing you can do is you do the same for your community, for your community. Get involved in your local community. You know, chat with your neighbors. That's one more thing you can do. Or another one you can do is uh, the shops or the businesses you go to regularly. Try to chat with the workers a little bit. You know, ask them a question. Ask them what their name is. T tell them your name. Start to, you know, to just to form a little bit of a connection. You're probably not going to become super close friends. That's not necessary, but... 
At least they become a real person, right, with a name, and you can start to have little short conversations, and they recognize you. Then it's more of a connection. It's more of a community, not just some worker. And you're not just some customer that they don't know. Well, they just see your face. You could get in- involved in uh, you know different clubs and organizations and things in your community. That's another way to do it. If you can, with your job, you could try to move to a smaller community, smaller towns, get go someplace where people automatically just know each other more. Another thing you can do, you can try to do, is don't move around so much. Now, I'm giving you advice that I did not follow for my life. (laughs) As a child, my father moved me around constantly, and then uh, as a single adult, I have moved around a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. But I am changing that. I've decided enough of that. I still travel, I still like it, but I realize that you know, raising a family and uh, having a family, I need to be have some roots not be wandering around everywhere so do that especially if you have kids don't move them around a lot keep them in one place that's how you build those communities and again you know and with politics with your nation with your country support laws support rules support movements that make communities stronger that make your nation stronger so people can stay in one place so that tradition, the traditions and history of your culture are honored. Fight against anybody who tries to tell you your people are evil or bad or racist or something. You know, Marxists do this. It's a technique of Marxism to attack. They do this in every single country. They will attack the history. They'll attack your heroes your traditions make say that they were bad, they were evil, they were racist. Try to make you hate your own people. Try to make you hate your own culture. Try to make you hate your own religion. Try to make you hate your own history. Try to make you hate your own heroes. This is a super common technique of the Marxists, of the globalists. They do this. They will do this in schools. They do this in the media. Fight them, fight them, fight them. And then finally, number three, faith. Again, find that in yourself. Strengthen faith first for yourself individually. Again, I'm not going to tell you a you know, specific religion to follow or even a specific philosophy to follow. That's for you to decide. I, Overall, in general, I would recommend starting with the faith, the religion, the tradition that is from your ancestors, your nation, your family. If you're from a Christian nation, Start with Christianity. If you're from a Muslim nation, Islam, right? A Buddhist nation, Buddhist. Now you might later decide that, you know, that another religion is better for you or maybe just a philosophy that is not religious, okay? But start by exploring your own faith first. And by exploring, I mean not just go to a church. A lot of churches have been destroyed now. A lot of, this is true in Islam. This is true in, um, it's true, definitely true in Buddhism. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's tr- probably true in Hinduism. Where, again, the Marxists, the globalists have taken control of so many of these groups. They've changed the traditional teachings. And so people go and then they just like, this is disgusting. What is this? This is just politics. This is, this is not what I want. And then they leave. This is the reason, you know, religion's having so many problems and so many people have a bad attitude about religion. Because again, so many of the religions, they've turned into something that they, they're not supposed to be. So, 
for rebuilding your own faith, you've got to read the books yourself, okay? St- read, the, read the books yourself. Start there first. If you're Christian, read the Bible yourself. You don't need someone else to tell you what it means. You read it. Don't just go to a church and let someone blah, blah, blah tell you this. Read it. And don't just read it. Study it. And don't just study it. Think about it. All of it together as one whole. After that, inst- again, don't just listen to some modern person teaching. They're probably, there's a good chance they're a Marxist, especially if they're Christian now. So instead of that, read the works, the books, the Christian books of the great Christian saints and teachers of the past. Augustine, St. Augustine, Aquinas, etc. I don't know all of, uh, there are many, okay? You've got a couple thousand, you've got 2,000 years of Christian thinkers and saints and philosophers to read and study. Study those. Read those, okay? Because any questions you have, any doubts you have, any problems and confusion you might have, I guarantee somebody, some great thinker, some great saint, already thought about it, already struggled with that problem, that doubt, and they found an answer. At least for them, they found an answer. Okay, you don't need some guy on TV to tell you. You don't need to. You're some local person who's a, you know, who's basically a left-wing Marxist communist or something to tell you the meaning of the Bible. If you're confused, if you're struggling, look to those old ancient philosophers and saints because you'll find much better, much, much, much deeper thought from them. And the same is true, you know, if you're, if you're Buddhist, it would be the same thing. Okay, I don't, you know, personally, I don't trust any, uh, any Buddhist writers that are modern, right, that, are, that, that were born uh, in my lifetime or, or even that were born in my parents' generation. I don't trust them. A lot of them are, very, are just, they became, you know, Buddhists quite late in their life. They're very clearly have a leftist kind of, uh, again, communist, Marxist uh, political strategy, agenda. And when I go and I look at the older teachings, the original teachings, the original in Buddhism, there's sutras, the Dhammapada, and then there's some, again, just like in Christianity, there are many old saints. Buddhists don't call them saints, but basically saints and monks who have, again, studied and thought about these questions. And I try to find those translations from them, and I find, guess what? Very, very different than what the modern American or European Buddhists teach. Be careful about the modern ones. I don't know specifically about Islam, but I'm guessing, again, probably the same. Again, Islam has a very, very, very long tradition with a great many martyrs and saints and philosophers, and I'm sure you can find a great number of teachings about this. Look to the ancients. If you're, if, if you're not interested in terms of faith, rebuilding faith for yourself, for your family, for your community... Uh, you can start instead of religion. If religion, for some reason, just, oh, you don't like it. It's not for you. Philosophy. You know, I mentioned again, you know, Stoicism, for example, and a, a very old, ancient Roman philosophy with deep, deep roots, with many great writings, with deep thought that is powerful and true and strong today just as it was thousands of years ago. You know, in the East, there's Taoism, which is Chinese. But again, very, very, very old philosophy. Powerful. I'm a big fan of Taoism myself.
we need this. You know, philosophy, religion, both, they're about the big, big questions of our lives. Okay, and you're not alone with these big questions, these questions that all humans have thought about and wondered. What is the purpose of life? Why? Why are we alive? Why is there anything? Why does anything exist? All these stars and galaxies and this planet and all this life. Why not just nothing? Where did it all come from? Where does it return to? Where do we ultimately, finally, come from? Where do we ultimately and finally return Big questions, okay? Modern, the modern world of education and media, they tell you, oh, don't think about these things. Right? They, they almost laugh and, and laugh about people who think about these questions, which is evil, because these are, these are the most important questions of life. I think it was Alan Watts who said, you know, in his answer, what is the meaning of life? He said, the meaning of life is to ask the question. It's to ask that, that exact question. What is the meaning of life? Meaning, what Alan Watts was saying, is that that is the meaning of life, is to search for the biggest truth, to search for the answer of where do we come from, where do we go, why life, why existence, what is the purpose of living? That that is our purpose, is to ask the question and look for the answers and to test the answers and find our best answers that we can. And without that, what are we doing? Just buying a bunch of stuff and then dying. So the destruction of religion, the destruction of faith, the weakening of religion, the weakening of faith, the weakening of ancient philosophy, not modern philosophy, I'm not going to waste my time with, but ancient philosophies, the weakening and destruction and attacks and all these is an, is an attack on humanity, our humanity. As far as we know, as far as we know, we are the only creatures on earth who can ask these questions and think about these things. And as far as I know, most people at some point in life ask these questions. We have these questions. They come to us. It is a natural part of being human. And if you're young, maybe, oh, you don't think about these big things. But I guarantee when you get older, when death starts getting closer, as you age, as you start to lose things in your life, as people around you die, you will ask these questions. You will face these questions. And so, again, purpose. Rebuilding and strengthening true religion, true philosophies. First for yourself, and then teach your children. Find others. Make your faith stronger for you and your community. This is how we fight back against this terrible evil that is destroying the happiness and ultimately will destroy everything that's great about civilization. Their goal is that we are a bunch of unhappy people with meaningless lives and all we do is work and buy things. Just work for them and buy things from them. And that's it. Weak families are no families. If you read um, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, no families. They completely eliminate families. Right? The government, the state, raises the children. That's their goal. School, forced schools, is the first and very successful step of that. Just take your kids most of the day. And eventually, they would like to destroy the family completely. And the same with community, and the same with faith. So, we fight back to make all of those stronger. Anyone who is against these three, you know they are your enemy. 
Do not believe their lies. Do not give them kindness. Do not give them compassion. Do not give them any trust at all. Do not trust anything they say. You don't need to argue with them. Just fight them. And most importantly, fight for, fight for your family. Fight for your community. Fight for your nation, your heritage, your culture. Fight for your faith, your philosophy, for truth, for virtue, for honor. It's a dark time, but we can win. We will continue our book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. We'll continue it this coming weekend. I'm finally going home. Going back home, I'll have uh, fast internet again. I'll be able to do some live video. So it'll be on the weekend. We'll continue with our next chapter. Uh, next chapter. I think it's... I don't remember which chapter number, but I think it's rule number... Four, I believe. Rule number four. So we'll be starting the section now where we're talking about interdependence. I-N-T-E-R. Inter means between. So it's, we're, we're talking about habits or virtues or skills that are about cooperation, working with others. Remember, this book has two parts. The first part is you take care of yourself. You make yourself stronger and better. Your character. But that's not enough. That's not enough. You have to then, next, is you use all of that to cooperate with other people, to improve your team, to improve your group, to improve your family, to improve your community, to be a good member of all of those. You know, someone recently asked me, uh, I think it was, was it Facebook or Gab? Might have been, I mean, uh, no, it might have been Twitter, actually. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they asked me about this guy, Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. He's this guy that uh, YouTube is pushing, pushing, pushing this guy constantly. Google. They're, they're, they will, if you're on YouTube, you're probably going to see his videos pop up as a suggestion because they really, really, really want him to be popular. Right away, that makes me suspicious. I don't trust them. Why are they pushing this guy so much? And I think I know why. Jordan Peterson, uh, I read his book. He, did, he wrote a book, kind of a self-help book. It's, I don't know, kind of basic, really basic self-help stuff, really. Not, nothing special. But the thing about Jordan Peterson, which I think is dangerous, the reason I think he's part of the, he's uh, on the enemy's side, is that Jordan Peterson... Uh, he te he's constantly teaching people not to cooperate. Don't be part of a group, right? He, he just, just be an individual. Just be an individual. Just focus on yourself only. Just the first half of the book we're doing. If you do that, then you become a victim. Then you, then it's, then you become weak, okay? We, we have to cooperate. We need groups. Identity. Identity is, identity is not a problem. You should fight for your family. You should fight for your nation, for your people. You should join together with them. You should cooperate. Absolutely. You should form groups. You should form teams. And yes, sometimes your team is going to have to compete against another or fight against another. Especially if they're attacking you, you have to fight them. If they're attacking you, if they're invading you, if they're doing bad things to you, if they're lying to you, then you've got to fight. And it's much better to fight as a team, to fight with other people, than to try to do it all by yourself. Because the enemy usually is working together. They're a team. They're a very big team with lots of money. So you better, you better, you must cooperate. You must join you do need an identity. You do need a family. You do need a nation. You do need a people. So this is why I don't like Jordan Peterson, because he teaches people not to do that. He's, he's trying to get people to just focus on themselves only as individuals, individuals. This is what they did in America to make everybody 
you know, weak and separate and lonely. So, anyway, I don't like Jordan Peterson for that reason, but I do like Stephen Covey in the book we're doing now because he does teach this, right? Half of his rules, his habits, are about cooperation, about working with others. We have to do that. There's no meaning in life. There's no feeling of purpose. There's no feeling of connection if it's just you alone. It's not enough just to be independent. That's just the first step. So this weekend, anyway, we'll start looking at cooperation. Now, how do we do this? It's difficult. Focusing on yourself is actually easier. You don't have to worry about anyone else. You can, if you just develop some motivation and some willpower, uh, you can work on those habits. You can make a lot of progress and improve a lot, just you. But then when you start dealing with other people, oh, then it becomes more difficult because other people have different ideas. Other people have different goals. You're going to disagree sometimes. There's also many times with other people, there's confusion, misunderstanding. You don't understand them. They don't understand you. How do we deal with all of that? so that we can cooperate. I mean, this is important for families, right? Parents, children, cousins, uncles, aunts, everything. It's important at work, when you're working with other people, a team, a staff of people. It's important if you're a business owner. Uh, it's important in your community. Anytime you're dealing with other people, well, we need some skills, some habits for communication, for understanding, uh, for persuasion, for leadership, all of these things. Stephen Covey has some ideas about this, about some kind of three big habits he has that will help in this area. And we'll talk about the first one this coming weekend. All right, well, I'm glad you're part of our Effortless English family. Very happy, and we have such a great group. You know, this is... Another thing that makes us special, because I see with our Effortless English members, it's not just about English. You know that. I know that. But with our code, you know, we do the best we can. We do the right thing. We show each other we care. We have good, good, good people. We attract good, good people. And on the other side, <laughs> I think we kind of repel, means we push away people who are not good. Or maybe another way to say this is uh, people who are bad, like the, you know, people who are very negative, people who want to uh, lie and cheat and all that, they just don't, they're not attracted to effortless English, I've noticed. You probably noticed, right? You can see on my Twitter groups, my Gab groups, Facebook we just don't get those kind of people, almost never. I think they can feel it. They can kind of, they look at all our comments and how we communicate. Maybe they listen to me and my show and they just realize, ah, uh, this is not for me. I can't, I can't cheat these people. I can't attack these people. They're too good. They're too strong. They're too helpful. They have this code. And so we attract more and more and more and more good people. And the bad people just automatically stay away. That's how you create, by the way, a good group. You have to have the ability, when you're with a group, you have to have the ability to do two things. Number one, to attract good people. And number two, you must have the ability to push away, to get rid of, to keep away bad people. You cannot welcome everybody. If you welcome everybody then the bad people will come in and they'll start destroying your group very quickly. You'll see this online anytime, right? Anytime you, like a forum or any kind of chat group or something, if you allow everybody to come in and you don't block, you don't have rules, you don't have anything like that, it's, it will quickly be destroyed by the worst people. Some people don't like this. Mostly it's the bad people don't like this, but... You absolutely must have rules and you must decide who you want to come into your group and who cannot join. I have very strict rules, very tough rules about who cannot join Effortless English. It's very simple. Anyone who will not follow our code. 
anyone who will not do their best, anyone who will not do the right thing, anyone who will not show other people they care, they're not welcome. They're just not welcome. Now, if people are quiet or shy and they just kind of stay quiet, that's okay. You can join, of course. But anyone who does the opposite of those, right? Anyone who comes in and they're just compl- they're lazy and they complain all the time, for example. Anyone who comes in and lies and cheats and criticizes everybody else. Anyone who is, you know, very super negative. I, they're blocked. If they buy my lessons, I give them a refund and they're gone. They're out. So, same for you. If you're trying to make your, uh, you know, some group, whether it's your company or any kind of organization, especially important if you know, like a church group or anything like that, get rid of the bad people. Have very, be very, very tough about that, and then your group will become much, much stronger. So I'm happy to have you because we do have a wonderful, great group, super international, all different countries and religions and ages and everything. We all respect each other even though we're not the same because we all follow that code. So thank you, Effortless English Family. Finally, commit to my VIP program. Commit to my VIP program. You've got to commit. You know it. That word is strong, it's powerful, and it's necessary. Not just join, commit. Commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go now to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Commit at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Lots of love.